Okay. How dominance is determined. So what's the what's the strategy for figuring out dominance? Like um, convert dominance versus predominance. So what do we do experimentally? <coughs> so hair type, for example. So how do we know that capital H, which is straight hair in my own crazy universe that I've created for this class, and the lowercase air, <coughs> lowercase h, produces wavy hair, and the capital H is dominant, and lowercase h is recessive. How did I figure out that capital H was dominant and lowercase h was recessive? We have to do something that's experimental. Mm -hmm. We empirically determine dominance. There's no way to know anything about whether or not a trait is dominant until you actually do a cross. So what cross do we use to determine dominance? Uh, hybrid. Uh, you want to make a monohybrid. Uh, okay. <laughs> so if you take an individual that's homozygous capital H, what's their phenotype? Their phenotype is straight hair. Yeah. And that's a pure breeding individual, meaning that if they selfed, it doesn't matter what species, what species it is, if you self that individual, they'll only produce offspring that have the same genotype if this is a plant, for example. And you take an individual that's pure breeding or homozygous for wavy hair. And cross them together. So what's the genotype of their offspring? It's 50-50. So it would be capital H. Hundred percent. There's like all of their offspring are going to have a capital H from the parent on the left and a lowercase h from the parent on the right. You get hundred percent heterozygotes in the F1 generation. Okay. So now, if I tell you that wavy hair, all those individuals are going to have one phenotype. They're all genetically identical, mm -hmm. so they're going to have one phenotype. If that phenotype is wavy hair then which allele is dominant? The recessive. Well. Well, technically in the previous... Lowercase h. Thing, yes. Yes. So if, you're right, if all of the F1s have a heterozygous genotype and they all have wavy hair, that defines the lowercase h as being the dominant or whatever, it doesn't, the nomenclature is irrelevant. Lowercase h, uppercase h, I could have called it h1 and h2. The fact is that when those phenotypes match, then you know that it's the allele that was inherited from the parent whose phenotype matches that's controlling the phenotype in the next generation. Yes. Regardless of whether or not I'm using capital letters or lowercase letters. So lowercase h is dominant in this case. So that's, yeah, so that's how we determine it, is that cross. Two pure breeding parents for two different traits, cross them together and you look at the phenotype of their offspring. And then the notation we just covered, capital letter and lowercase letter is usually how we define. Once we learn about dominance, then the dominant allele gets assigned a capital letter and the recessive allele gets assigned a lowercase letter. Can you go, oh, sorry. sorry. You first. Oh, I want another question. Why you go first? Like, okay. <laughs> um, the, so when you're looking at something like that, how do you just determine if it's denotated then? It, sorry? How do, when you're looking at something, you've already identified which of them is dominant. Okay. How do you know when they're going to be denotated for uh, genotype in that situation? Or is that a completely separate question? I think that's a separate question. So once you figure out dominance, 
then you assign for assuming that you've got a gene that only has two alleles. Mm -hmm. Once you know dominance, then you call the dominant allele the capital letter and the recessive allele the lowercase letter. And from then on, then you know that if you're looking at an individual that's got two capital letters in their genotype or one, that they have the dominant trait. And that if you have a homozygous recessive lowercase h over lowercase h, then they have the recessive. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Can you go over, like, when we have, to, when you give us the genes and we have to figure out the parents' phenotype? Yeah. So I give you something and you have to figure out parent genotype? Phenotype. Um, like the backward? Yeah, the backward. So back cross is a type of process that's slightly unrelated, I think, to the question, but we'll see. So if I tell you, so what do you want me to tell you about the F1? Let's say we've got two generations here. We've got P0 genotypes and phenotypes, and they're going to be crossed together and produce an F1 that has a particular genotype and a particular phenotype. Because in the example you give with your, like, you said, I'm going to give you my genotype, and you're going to figure out my parent. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking about genotypes, so let's forget phenotypes for a minute. Good. We're getting there. So let's say the genotype of the F1 individual is how oh, I use D. Can't do that. Uh, e. Complicated. Got four different genes going on. So can, from that information, what can you figure out about the genotypes of the two parents? Not much, but you can figure some parts out. One parent doesn't have an A. Well, each, so each oh, parent, okay. these are four different genes, okay. yeah? yeah? Four different letters. So we've got gene... We've got one gene there, a second gene there, a third gene there, and a fourth gene there. And semicolons mean that they're on four separate chromosomes. So I'm going to make those, like I did in class, differently sized chromosomes to make it really obvious that we're talking about different chromosomes. We've got two capital A's, two capital A alleles, one's a capital B and a lowercase b, we've got two capital D's, and we've got two lowercase e's. So I guess one way to think about this would be what I do in class when I say one's a paternal allele. So there's one of those two chromosome A's is AP, A from dad, A paternal, and one of those is A sub M, the maternal copy. So if an individual is homozygous for big A's, A over A, what's the genotype? Which parent did those come from? Wait, you said sub A. I mean sub M. So one of these is going to be paternal, and one of those is going to be maternal. So you could just, we could just do that right now. I'm making this up. You can't always just guess, but let's say that's the pattern for the purpose of this question. So if you do that, then you know that, and the point is that for every chromosome, you get one copy from your mom and one copy from your dad. So if you're homozygous... What do you know about your parents' alleles on chromosome A? What's your dad's haplotype? Or what sort of a genotype does your dad have? It has to be, well, it has to have at least one capital A because that's the only way that kid gets a capital A.
Now, do we know anything about okay. what the other version of Dad's chromosome A looks like? No, cr uh, chromosome A still, okay. right? We're talking about diploid individuals. So this offspring was homozygous for the capital A allele. That means that each of his parents have a capital have one capital A. That's exactly how that individual inherited in those alleles and got that genotype. So we're just running the logic backwards. We're saying if this individual in the F1 has that genotype, then the parents had to have those alleles. One parent had one allele, one had the other. But do we know what is happening here? So each of these parents are also diploid for chromosome A. So what do you write on the other side of that slash? Can you figure that out from the information that you have? No. Now, what about chromosome B? Okay, semicolon in there, now we're talking about a different chromosome. Do we know anything about which parent had we do because I wrote in these P's and M's, but before that, would you know which parent the capital B and which parent the lowercase b came from? You just know that one of your parents has a capital B, at least one, maybe two, we don't know, because we only have half of the genotype information when you look at the offspring. So we don't even know which parent has the capital B and which has the lowercase b. And then we definitely don't know anything about what their other copy, the parent's other copy of chromosome B looks like. And so we can't, I'm putting this, I'm writing this down, but this is totally arbitrary. Those could be in the opposite order. It could be the dad that's got the lowercase b and the mom that's got the uppercase b. But then again, we know for the chromosome that has gene D and the chromosome that has gene E, we're sure that both parents have the same allele because these individuals are homo this individual, the F1, is homozygous. So just like at gene A. If you're homozygote, you know that your parents have at least one of the identical D over something, capital D over something that's unknown. And the same is true for, oops, except that's lowercase e. And the only way we fill in any of these question marks is by having more than one F1 offspring. So if you can start looking at siblings of the F1, then you start figuring out what are the, what are the question marks possibly. So for example, briefly, I want to move on in case there are other questions, since this was only a minor part of class. Um, if we looked at another sibling and their genotype was... lowercase a over lowercase a then we know the parents full genotypes but only then because we know that each of the parents also has to have a lowercase a so then we know both of the parents are heterozygotes because that's the only way that those two individual parents could make offspring that are both that one is homozygous for capital A and the other is homozygous for lowercase a And that's the only situation for a diploid when you have offspring that have both homozygous genotypes that you know for sure that the parents are heterozygotes. Otherwise, you never can tell what the parent genotypes are. For sure. <coughs> I found a question online about for gene 2... Um meiosis and different types of um, spermatype, and I was curious how would you go about answering it, or if you Hey, could. that looks familiar. Let's see. Oh, uh, we haven't done that yet. Okay. Because I was looking at it, and I was like, well, it's similar. 
similar, but I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah, so we haven't done recombination yet, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay. okay. We're about to. Ah. In fact, I think that means I do have to, at some point, tell you which video to watch for next Monday, but I know nobody's probably worried about next Monday yet, so <laughs> I haven't bothered. Read this chart again. Ooh, yeah. Yep. Thank you. I was just trying to find that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, now you're seeing the actual version, but on this, I'm just going to draw a few different chromosomes and sort of replicate what this looks like. So we've got chromosome number on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we've got n, or the numbers of copies of a chromosome, up to four. And we can look at the first polar body, which is supposed to be what ploidy? It's supposed to have how many first polar body of meiosis, female meiosis, oogenesis? It's supposed to have how many copies of every chromosome? Supposed to have two. So that's our expected line. And then the second polar body and the what this graph calls female pronucleus, which equals oocyte. What are their DNA contents supposed to be? supposed to be. Yeah, they're supposed to be haploid. So they're supposed to have one. So that's the expectation for the genotypes of the second polar body and the oocyte itself. So what this plot's showing is actual sequence data from these different cells taken from females. And so for chromosome 1, and this is all just simple math. We know that each meiosis starts with how many copies of every chromosome. You start with two, go through synthesis, so you're temporarily tetraploid. So there should be a total of four copies of every chromosome scattered through these three cells. So let me sketch across the top here really quickly. So you've got four, well, yeah. You start with a diploid cell, you do DNA synthesis, you get four copies of every chromosome. You do the first division, you get two cells with two, and you do the second division, and you get four cells that each have a single copy of every chromosome. And that's why the first polar body, which is one of those two cells, is should be diploid. And the second polar body in the female pronucleus Sorry, I just drew male meiosis up here. So what we were talking about in class is that in females, you stop here with a f primary polar body, and that cell divides and produces the secondary polar body and the oocyte. So that's how we got those numbers, the N, for the first polar body and the second polar body and the oocyte. So there's a total of four chromosomes divided among those three cells. So it's, it's basically just math. If you have two copies of chromosome 1 in the first polar body, and if you have one copy of chromosome 1 in the second polar body, then what's in the oocyte? 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 copies of the chromosome. It has to be 1 because... 2 plus 1 plus 1, every, whatever it is, has to equal the four molecules of DNA we started meiosis with. Now, of course, this whole thing breaks down if you're not convinced that you started meiosis with four molecules of DNA. So that's a, that's a big assumption. 
unfortunately, that's usually right. You diploid cell, all the chromosomes double. You start with four copies of every chromosome. So what, is, what does it look like when things go wrong? Well, what happens if you have on chromosome 2, say, the primary polar body has two copies, and the second polar body has two copies? What's in the oocyte? Zero. Zero. So you have no chromosome 2 in the oocyte, because the four chromosomes that we started meiosis with are already in the first and the second polar bodies. And on chromosome 3, let's say you find three copies of chromosome 3, and you find none in the second polar body. Then the fourth one is in the oocyte. And of course, the whole idea behind this is that you don't actually touch the oocyte. You just look at the sequences from the first and the second polar bodies, and then you subtract. So you start with four molecules of DNA. There's two there, there's one there. That means there must be one in the oocyte. If there's two there and two there, if we start with four and we subtract two and two, that means there's none left for the oocyte, and so forth. Right, so the idea is you want to find an oocyte that has one copy of every chromosome. That's the, yes, that's the punchline. Yeah. Although, oh, I don't know, I guess I'll tell you this. I should probably save it for the final, but everyone's going to get the benefit of hearing this recording if they so choose. Um, the, then the whole assumption is that the oocyte, if you find one that has one copy of every chromosome, you also have to assume that the sperm that's fertilizing the egg also has one copy of every chromosome. So we haven't done anything to assure ourselves that dad's producing useful gametes. We just assure ourselves that the oocyte is haploid. Um, that's, my understanding is that's usually more of an issue because of the effect we know of females in aging, and the, the older you are when you're when fertilization happens, the more likely it is that the oocyte undergoes non-disjunction events to cause aneuploidy in the oocytes. So I think the understanding in, in biology is that it's more an oocyte quality issue than it is a sperm genetic quality issue in terms of numbers of chromosomes. And that that's why more emphasis was put on figuring out, is the oocyte genetically okay, haploid, as opposed to worrying about the sperm. So this question that was just pulled up has an individual with this genotype, and they call that a tester individual. And ignoring the fact that we've got multiple letters with no punctuation between them, each on one side of a slash, this nomenclature we'll get to later, that's basically the same thing. That is the equivalent of writing that. So the individual that's got, we're looking at three different genes, and they're homozygous for a lowercase letter in each of those genes, which is the definition of a tester individual. An individual that's homozygous for the recessive allele for every gene we're looking at. And that's all we've talked about in terms of testers in class so far. The tester genotype is going to be recessive, homozygous recessive. And if you don't know whether or not an allele is dominant or recessive yet, then I'll leave it up to you to de decide if you want to guess or just s explicitly state an assumption. I assume that allele A1 is dominant to allele A2, and therefore a test would be A2 over A2. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I'm so hyped up about testers will become obvious as we get to recombination and genetic mapping in the next couple of weeks. They're really critical for that process. Until then, it seems like a weird obsession of mine. I'm equally obsessed with heterozygotes, though.
mono hybrids and dihybrids and testers. No more. The, um, the box that we talked about last time um, to upload anything yes. so it could be viewed by the entire class, it does not work. I tried it again and got help with um, hmm. okay. Discover E, and they couldn't figure out why it wasn't allowing anything to be uploaded without huh. credentials. But you got, oh, that was the app. Okay, I'll follow up on that with people that are higher up than that. Maybe there's something weird about Box. So you were trying to log in with your mail.fresnostate.edu yes. credentials. Okay. Now it's... Sorry, I already asked that, right? That was using the Box app. Yes. I even and uploaded the app, so it would make it, thinking it would make it easier, and that didn't make it easier either. And did we wind up trying on a web browser? Mm-hmm. And that didn't? Yeah, we tried three different web okay. browsers. And three different web browsers. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's useful information. Discovery thought maybe it was because I was on a certain Wi-Fi for Fresno State, so... Oh, I that could be it. So we switched it, and it didn't work. To edge your own? Yeah. Wow. So, it just doesn't like me. <laughs> Is anybody else... I can do it, but that doesn't mean anything. Because I double-checked when I set it up, and of course I could log in, but that doesn't mean anything, obviously. Thank you for taking the time to have done that. No problem. So, um, to turn in those types of questions, where do I go now? You can email files to me, or we could share them on a Google Drive or something like that. Okay. So it depends on the size of the file, basically. Okay. Let me know once you have one. Try emailing it to me as an attachment. If it's too big, then we'll go from there. Because right. I can drop it into the box one. Bring it to me on a flash drive. That's hard if it's created on a tablet. So, yeah. so email would be best one? Email's one way to do it, yes. Can you have a cell cell um, cell feeding or like cell <coughs> selfie? Cell selfie, yeah. Maybe. Let's talk something. All right. So the only weird thing about selfing is that one individual produces both sexes of gametes. And we've only really talked about selfing in the context of a monohybrid, but you could have a dihybrid self, you could have a trihybrid individual self. Um, but let's start with monohybrid. So you have a diploid individual that's, I'm going to say this one gene, I'm just going to use plus and minus as the two different alleles. I could use capital letters and lowercase letters, anything for that matter. Just changing it up a bit. So what sort of gametes does this individual produce? What haplotypes of gametes? Right. So synthesis, you get two pluses and two minuses. Division one, the pluses stay together, the minuses stay together. And then the second division, you get two pluses and two minuses. So as in every other case of meiosis, you wind up generating half of the gametes have one of the two alleles, and the other half of the gametes have an equal number of the other allele.
And it's because of, it's entirely because of the mathematics of meiosis. That when you have a diploid, you start with two chromosomes. After synthesis, you've got four of each chromosome. And th those four get split into four different cells. Because you're a diploid, there's only a, there's a maximum of two alleles per individual. So there's either one or two, right? An individual for a gene will either have two of the same allele or they'll have one of two different alleles, yes? It's mathematically impossible to do anything else. And that's why in a Punnett square, you either are going to have, for one gene, you're either going to have one axis, that is the gametes of one parent split in half. And that's because half of the gametes have plus and half of the gametes have minus. So you divide that vertical line exactly in half. That just represents the fraction of gametes that are plus versus minus. Or if this individual is homozygous, then you wouldn't even need to draw that horizontal line. You just say 100% of the gametes have plus. You don't even need to make two different rows. But in this case, we're talking about heterozygote. So half of their gametes have plus haplotypes and half have minus. So a cell thing, um, let's say those were the sperm. half plus bearing sperm and half minus bearing sperm. What about the oocytes? What about the eggs? Right. The individual, the somatic tissue, the genetic makeup of the entire individual that's being selfed is heterozygous. So the cells that go through meiosis to make the sperm are heterozygous. The cells that go through oogenesis to make the eggs are also heterozygous. So just like the sperm, half of the eggs have plus and half of the eggs have minus. And so then you fill down, pluses in that column and minuses in that column. You can fill across, pluses there and minuses there. And then you get the expected numbers or ratios of genotypes in the F1 generation. Which, yep is one to two to one genotype ratio. And if, this is an if, if plus is dominant to minus, but we don't know, we haven't checked yet. We'd have to do the cross to figure out dominance. We'd have to cross a plus over plus and a minus over minus. And we'd have to know that the plus over plus made one phenotype and minus over minus made a different phenotype, and then we'd have to see what their heterozygous kids looked like to figure out dominance. But if I asked for, if I said plus was dominant, then any individual that had a plus would have one phenotype. And that poor little lower right-hand corner is the only one that has the other phenotype, and that would be the three-to-one phenotype ratio. Kind of like that wild type. Mutant. <laughs> yeah. So anytime selfing happens, the two axes of the Punnett square are going to be exactly the same. If you figure out one, you just copy the same information onto the other axis. And for that reason, the most simple question I could ask, which I think I did at some point already, is what happens if you self an individual that's homozygous. What is the Punnett square? It's going to be 80 because they're all homozygous. That's it. 100% of the offspring are A over A. This is cloning. This clonal reproduction. It's like how bacteria, although bacteria are not diploid, how bacteria work, how my nematodes work, for example, the hermaphrodites, once they're homozygous, they can only ever have offspring that are genetically identical to them. And to expand your minds a little bit, not that that's what you're here for, but um, that's 
usually detrimental to organisms to clonally reproduce because there is no genetic diversity. So you have a mom that makes, in the case of Cenorhabditis, hundreds of offspring, all of which are exactly genetically identical. And if it turns out that they find themselves in nature, not in my lab, in nature, if a population of C. briggsi or C. elegans nematodes finds themselves in an environmental situation, an ecological situation where that genotype is not useful, then they all die. And they all go, that goes extinct, basically. So it's better if you have some individuals that are homozygous big A and heterozygous and homozygous little a out in nature because if this genotype, big A over big, big A, happens to be non-useful, bad, then you have some other individuals in, of the same species that maybe are slightly better adapted or better fit in that environment that can keep on reproducing and keep the lineage of that species going. Um, I had a question related to that. Um, I seen one time um, on the news that they're doing cloning with sheep. Um, I don't understand, like, why would you do that? Oh, this is a different version of cloning. Um, so that's, yeah, the cloning is one of the most difficult aspects of genetics to talk about because there are multiple meanings to the word cloning. Multiple. And that one is actually talking about cloning entire organisms. So that's not talking about reproducing by self-fertilization, which is this sort of clonal reproduction, which it's called. That sort of cloning is, can you take chromosomes from different cells and combine them together to create life without fertilization? So this is fertilization-based reproduction. Cloning is, can you take, like, a skin... This is sci-fi, except it's not really, because some people have reportedly done it. Can you take one of my skin cells and then make a whole new organism out of that? That's that sort of cloning they're talking about with the sheep. And Dolly the sheep was the most famous example of that, which has been, what, like a couple decades now, was the first, I don't know, first vertebrate, first mammal, even, maybe to be clonally reproduced. So that's making a new organism that grows from single cell embryo to adulthood where that single cell that life started from was not the product of a fertilization. That wasn't sperm meat egg. That was, here's a cell, give it a push, and it divides and divides and divides and creates a, an entire organism without starting at fertilization. That's cloning version one. There's other types. This is clonal reproduction. That's a second meaning of cloning. And that makes it difficult to discuss these in class sometimes because people hear the term cloning and there are all sorts. I do molecular cloning, which is recombinant DNA technology or taking bits of chromosomes. I used to, anyway, I don't now. Taking parts of chromosomes or genes from certain organisms and putting them in other organisms. That's also called cloning. That's how, for example, the worms got the green fluorescent protein to glow green in our example in class. That was taking a, a gene from, what was it, jellyfish, and putting it into Cenorhabditis. That involves DNA cloning, which has nothing to do with clonal reproduction or Dolly the sheep cloning. I wish nomenclature wasn't so important, but it really is. And that's why... I'm glad you asked, but that's a real difficulty in many aspects of science. You have to be very careful what words you use. When the question earlier in class about can you use the word gene and allele interchangeably, They're, they have different meanings, so depending on who you're talking to, you might say gene and they think one thing or another. Good question. What do you mean when yeah. what fraction of the F1 genotype? What fraction? So let's see, what is this? Practice question one from one of our lectures. So that means make a Punnett square. Punnett square. So you, if you cross two individuals together mm -hmm. and I ask you what fraction of their offspring do anything, that's, in this case that we're looking at on the screen right here, you would say 100% of the offspring are homozygous big A. If this was a cross, the one, like the one we just looked at, I think this is like the one we just looked at, where it's a homozygote times a heterozygote, and you have a two-cell Punnett square. And I said, what fraction of the offspring are going to be homozygous? 50%. Yeah, 
and you'd fill out the Punnett square, and you'd see that this is a prediction, of course. Punnett squares just are for predictive purposes. You would say that, yeah, half of the area of that Punnett square is homozygous okay. genotypes. So you'd say half of the offspring should be homozygous. Yeah, so if, if you ever hear the t word, see the word predict, estimate, guess, something about a genotype, and it has to do with a cross, that implies do the Punnett square. Figure out all of the different genotypes or phenotypes that could be produced, and then tell me what fraction of those are the ones that I'm looking for. Tomorrow, no, I don't think so. No. about 10 minutes early like usual. That is 10.50. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good afternoon. You too. Sure. So we can um, sell or the hybrid um, the hybrid ones can do the cell thing as well. So you can make dihybrids, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. You could self a dihybrid, or you could cross two dihybrids together. Okay. It's the same outcome. Because by definition, selfing is, selfing is the same thing as crossing two individuals with the same genotype. If we have a question where we have to fill out a dihybrid cross, yeah. what would be the fastest way to do it? Because that's going to be like... <laughs> I, think, I think I said in class, and it's true, but I'll tell you again, I will not ask you to fill out a full dihybrid Punnett square okay. during an exam. Right. It takes too long. Just how to set it up, right? Or yeah, I could ask you, yeah, like fill in the haplotypes the, like, the cr across the top and down one side, and I could say stop there. But I wouldn't, have, yeah, filling out, filling in the square after you figure out the haplotypes of the gametes is, yeah, it takes too long. For number five, um, this is what I did last night. This is what you mean with. I was working on it last night. <laughs> you, see, you ask how many different genotypes are produced by the telling cross. So this is what I did. Is that what you want, technically? Genotypes? Yeah, so the... And that's a, that would be the phenotypic ratio, I believe. Let's see. Is that what the key said? Let's look back at the question. Okay. So you should have it Okay, so go forward and go back to your answer. Right. So what you did here was you've got two columns here. That column and that column have the same gamete. Mm -hmm. So those cells are all identical, okay. left to right, left to right. And the same is true of those pairs of cells. So you could have just drawn, you could have not drawn the leftmost column and the rightmost column, and it would have given you exactly the same information. So yeah, it's going to be eight different genotypes in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one ratio, which is exactly this. I would, you would get credit for that, okay. saying because it's the same thing. Two to two to two to two to two to two to two ratio is the same thing as a one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one-to-one ratio. I 
I just had one more question. Yeah, please. I'm uh, pretty sure you probably clarified this in class, but I just wanted to make yeah. sure. Um, so dominance is just relative to the population. Say if a population, if um, the, there's a disease most common in that population, would that mean that the dominant trait in that population is... That's wild type versus mutant. Oh. Wild type phenotype is the one that's most common. So yes, if there was a disease... So think about it this way, maybe. One of the leading causes of human death is death. It's a very common disease in humans. We all die. That's wild type. So th it's a stupid example, but it's an example of a wild type disease. Like, it's common. Everybody gets this disease. It's like having HIV. Like, an HIV will be a, an example, maybe? So, well, I don't know. That's a different example. But, yes. So whatever's common is usually referred to as wild-type condition, whether it be a phenotype or a genotype. Whatever's most common is wild-type. Whatever's rare is usually considered mutant. Not always the case, but in general, that's a good way to just define that. Dominant versus recessive is defined by crossing two homozygous individuals together, one for one, one homozygote with one allele and one homozygote for the other allele, and finding out what the phenotype of their offspring is. We talked about that last class, I think, and the class before that as well. That's the biological, how we biologically define dominant versus recessive. See, I kind of got those interchanges. Right, yeah. yep. So that's, yeah, wild type versus mutant, that's one concept. And then dominant and recessive is other... The reason that you got that confused is because I keep saying dominant does not mean predominant. What's common, this is, if you remember anything, it's what's common, if it's common, that doesn't mean that it's caused by a dominant allele. And the example of that was brachydactyl. That those shortened fingers are caused by a mutation that's dominant. If you're heterozygous for that capital B allele, you get brachydactyly. But it's not very common. It's mutant. And it's caused by a mutation that's dominant. So wild type is going to be most common. Yeah, so wild type is having fingers that look something like that. But that's, this is recessive. I'm, I've got a recessive disorder. I've got wild type length fingers and toes. The dominant version of this trait is mutant. It's rare, but it's caused by a dominant mutation that causes your fingers not to grow as long as what's wild type or common. Yeah, so that's a little confusing. It, Thank you. It is. It's very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. That's Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Number 10, would you cross a, a dominant with a uh, recessive one, technically? So, this question tells you what genotypes to cross. Guys, brown, okay. So, if you cross, well, this is the, this is the second line. Cross one fly that's homozygous recessive. No, big B, no, two little bees. Yep. To a big B of a... Yeah. Oh, all right. Yep. And then you just have to be able to convert those genotypes of the offspring of that cross into phenotypes. So what does it mean to be big B over big B, big B over little B, and little B over little B? 